Thanks, Curtis. Thank you for speaking. Oh, look at that. Let's do, do this. There we are. Okay. Who are we missing here? Oh, Dean Summer. I have to bring all my stuff. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I want, I'm, I'm, first of all, I want to thank the first two uh, moderators in the panels because I think it, it was very helpful to get us uh, where we are now, which is maybe the, our opportunity to really start talking a, in a bit more detail about um, some opportunities moving forward for the public process that we've been uh, discussing. Um, uh, and to do that, I have an, a, a, we have a great panel here um, that I will uh, begin by introducing, and then we'll get right to it. Um, starting immediately to my left, Aaron Ben-Joseph is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Planning and Head of the Joint Program in City Design and Development at MIT. His research and teaching areas include urban and physical design, design standards and regulations, sustainable site planning technologies, and urban retrofitting. He's the author of Streets and the Shaping of Towns and Cities, Regulating Place, The Code of the City, and Renew Town. Wow. Iran, Iran worked as a city planner and urban designer in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, and the United States on projects including new towns and residential developments, streetscapes, stream restorations, and parks and recreation planning. He holds degrees from the University of California at Berkeley and Chiba National University in Japan. Uh, next to Aaron is uh, Richard Summer, who is an architect and the Dean of the Daniels School of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. Summer's professional and academic activities are diverse and include serving since 2005 as the O'Hare Chair in Design and Development and Visiting American Scholar at the University of Ulster, where he has worked with the government agencies, academics, and other groups to develop proposals for the design of Northern Ireland's cities and towns as they emerge from the Troubles. Justin Hollander is an assistant professor of urban design, of urban and environmental uh, policy and planning at Tufts University and a research scientist at the George Perkins Marsh Institute at Clark University. He is the author of three books and over 20 uh, refereed journal articles, with most of his work focused on the challenges of planning for post industrial declining cities. Ellen Liu is a uh, a director of city design at Skidmore Owings in Maryland, San Francisco. Her work has been focused on the creation of vibrant city cores, the fusion of old. Yeah. Cell phones. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, her work has been, fo uh, been focused on the creation of vibrant city cores, the fusion of old and new urban fabrics, the rejuvenation of the natural environment. Uh, Ms. Liu is particularly skilled at developing innovative ideas and in guiding uh, development interests to create public benefit. James Miner is head of planning and urban design at Sasaki Associates, an internationally recognized design firm. He has built his practice around bringing different constituent groups together to create a seamless relationship between the public realm and the private sector in cities, on campuses, and in between. And uh, next to James, Curtis Kemeny is CEO and president of Boston Residential Group, which he founded in 2003. Since then, Mr. Kemney has developed and managed several high-profile luxury apartment and condominium projects in the Boston area, including 360 Newbury Street, 285 Columbus Lofts in Boston, Linden Square Apartments in Wellesley, Battle Green Apartments in Lexington, 1008 Mass Ave in Cambridge, and Stonegate at Weston, at, at Weston in Weston. Uh, he recapitalized his, his project Church Park Apartments, a 508-unit mixed-use apartment complex in Boston. Um, he leads the development of the Hemingway Theater Complex of, for the Boston Conservatory of Music, of which he is vice chairman of the board. Mr. Kemeny received a BA from Dartmouth in 1984 and, and, and his MBA from Harvard Business School in 1989. Okay. And, uh, we have two more panelists. This is, this is our, I guess, our biggest panel yet. Uh, David Lee is a graduate researcher at the Sensible City Laboratory and PhD candidate in urban studies at MIT. His research focuses on how digital technologies can spur innovation around critical urban issues. He has contributed to several projects with Sensible, including Trash Track 
MIT internet, lives live or live Singapore, <laughs> sea swarm, and eye spots, all of which he will explain in great detail to us <laughs> in a moment. We all know Trash Track. I want to see okay, you. very good. And finally, Armando Carbonell is chairman of the Department of Planning and Urban Forum at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is policy and practice editor of Town Planning Review, Journal of the Royal Town Planning Institute, and has taught at Harvard University and the University of Pennsylvania. So with that uh, distinguished collection of um, guests, let me get started. Um, as we've gone through um, the discussion today thus far, it seems to me, we have been talking about uh, obviously the history of the process in the morning and, and a very Boston-centric view of the process in this afternoon. And that was just you know, the nature of, of the panel. But uh, Boston is a very good example because it, it, does, it has a process that has um, uh, developed over time. And I think we heard from a lot of people, um, whether it's one you would design from the beginning or not, it does seem to achieve reasonable objectives uh, in many cases. Now, th there, was, there are disputes about how long it takes, but um, there, was, there, was, there seemed to be a, a consensus, in fact, that um, some of the projects that didn't make it through the process in, in the afternoon panel really didn't, didn't make it through, not because of the process, but because they weren't good, gonna be good projects. So um, I think what we wanna do here is think about, um, because whatever you say about the, the process in Boston, it is a, uh, uh, to use David Hassin's term, it is a camel. Uh, it, 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 is, it has been joined together from a lot of different parts, and, it's, and it doesn't seem like an uh, inherently coherent plan from the beginning. What I'm hoping we can get at this afternoon in the, on the final panel is what are some of the specific um, opportunities that we have using technology, using different methods um, to uh, uh, embrace a more transparent process, one that engages a wider range of constituents more accurately, and that maybe can map uh, uh, possible futures. And I know several of the panelists uh, have, 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 have worked in those areas. So maybe uh, I should get started. And David, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you um, and, and ask, what are some of the technology choices that you guys are using to try to uh, uh, imagine different kinds of cities? Uh, thanks. So you mentioned the use of technology to model the future. And actually, uh, from what I'm seeing in the lab and a lot of recent projects is that you can actually use technology much better to hap uh, sense what's happening today in real time. And even that is a huge uh, challenge to anybody who's ever looked at transportation planning or land use planning, knowing what's happening right at this moment. Uh, w one of the projects that we're working on right now, Trash Track, which actually wrapped up last year, and we're doing another one this year for the MoMA, is looking at where your trash goes in real time. So it's actually attaching small GPS-enabled sensors that can communicate with you wirelessly uh, to pieces of trash and then throwing them away. So we did this in Seattle with 2,000 trackers, and we saw where all types of trash went in the city, how they leave the city, how they go across the country, sometimes in very strange and clearly inefficient routes uh, to get to where they're going. And so there's this opportunity to directly engage. People can actually see where the trash went. We went to volunteers and we asked them to attach the trackers to their trash and engage them in a very different way of opening up all these questions that nobody had ever asked before. Um, is the recycling system actually functioning? Is this actually more uh, sustainable than just throwing away in the trash where the trash dump might be right next door, whereas sending a battery across the country might take a lot of energy, so. Right. Well, that, Can I just say that's a fantastic idea? <laughs> right, right, here, here. I agree. I agree, and, and, and it's one that, it's, it's one that there, I think there are lots of examples uh, nowadays of trying to uh, track the actual consequences of, of actions, and I think that's really what I wanna, where I want to get started because it relates to a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, Armando, we, we uh, are able now to model a variety of futures um, uh, as well, in other words, we make different choices as a society or as a, as a city, um, and there are different consequences to them. We've heard some of them today. Should, there, should we have tall buildings downtown, or should we 
have lower buildings and spread out farther, for example? Or what are, and are there ways that the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy is, is looking at some of those futures uh, and, and, and the consequences of those kinds of choices? Well, I'm so glad you asked, George, because I <laughs> happen to, uh, to have with me some, uh, some door prizes. Okay. Uh, and and all, all I require is a, some, some sign of enthusiasm at the end of this, and I will be giving these away and not dragging them back. Okay. And, and just so Justin, Justin doesn't think, because uh, I, I gave a talk at his class yesterday, and he knows I'm cleaning out my office, but <laughs> some of these still have the plastic wrap on them. So they, <laughs> these are first quality. They're, they're not discards at all. They're not trash, all right? And no, <laughs> there's no GPS. I'll be very clear No that. GPS okay. included, <laughs> okay? But, but uh, among them is a book called Engaging the Future, a Forecast, Scenarios, Plans, and Projects. And, and just to say a word, uh, scenarios. Uh, one of the ways to engage people in, in thinking about the future is to have them consider a lot of possible futures. And one of the things that we've discovered, especially in dealing with challenges like climate change, is there's huge uncertainty about the future. Uh, it's better to not think about the future as something you predict as as something you sort of uh, steal yourself for and consider a range of possible outcomes and think about what would happen if the worst of those happened and what would happen if the best of those happened, but prepare for uh, a range of scenarios in the face of real uncertainty about what the future is going to hold. Right. Well, that's, 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 uh, that sounds very promising to me. I mean, I think the first uh, example, uh, or the first example of this that I'm aware of uh, was work done by, uh, of this, at this kind of scale, was work done by Peter Calthorpe probably, I don't know if it was 15 years ago already in places like Salt Lake City and so forth, where, where the uh, uh, ability to show people Regardless of, you know, there will be a future, <laughs> or assuming that there is a future, here are, their, here are, are the, co the consequences five, 10, 20 years out of a, a, a series of choices that you're facing today. And many people, I think, in the, in the, in the world of, of design review or planning uh, or thinking critically about the city and, and, and uh, metropolitan areas, um, our, our people are always concerned that um, uh, citizens are not given the real data to make real choices. Right? That, that it, it, it's, I don't want to get back to the car issue. We covered that very well on the second panel. But you know what I mean, that if we see the actual cost to us of different scenarios, that maybe we'll make different kinds of, 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 of choices. Richard, when you were uh, uh, doing work on sort of alternative views of uh, the Big Dig, maybe 10 years ago, you brought in uh, ways of reflecting the interests of a very different set of constituents. Do you want to just say a little bit about that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I uh, had always done work uh, as an architect and an urban designer, but in um, thinking through this problem, I, I, and I would characterize the, especially the discussion this morning, is dealing with a historical trajectory where, on the one hand, we have seen, I think in a positive way, the democratization of the planning process where more and more Publics, if you will, and constituencies uh, have a say and uh, and are part of the process. But during you know that arc that begins in a way in response to urban renewal, uh, we also had a period of time when even during urban renewal, the investment is actually and, and the work is not actually being done by the public sector or by the state. It's it's becoming done more and more by uh, through private interests and through the interests uh, of. Uh, of private capital, and 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 they see the world and 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 see their rights in the process very differently. So, we we have these two things running up in parallel, and we got I, I think uh, despite how well Boston has put the camel together to manage this process, if we go outside of the you know the pretty center of Boston, this this uh, this um, stalemate gets ugly pretty quickly. Um, so one of the things uh, I started to think about both in my work and the, and the teaching I was doing at, uh, at the time was how you begin to conceptualize uh, design in the contested field, to use the term from, from, from this event. And what it had to do is, is trying to understand the role that design plays in visualizing not so much futures, but the contemporary desires and pathologies of you know, eco, uh, you know, open space advocates, uh, developers, uh, uh, various communities, communities. Because, because during this period I'm describing when you, when you get the democratization of the, uh, of the, of the planning process and uh, you know, one of the things that happens, in the, in this, especially in the center of American cities, is, is as people get more rights to occupy the city, the city becomes more dispersed 
and uh, the a actual occupation of the city becomes more and more difficult. So we can't any lo longer speak in terms of a public, we're talking about many publics. And so you have to begin to understand that even, even one person, George Thrush, as a, you know, as, as a garden lover, is part of one community, and as someone who lives in, in a piece of Cambridge is, is part of another, and we all have very complex relationships to any given project, and you, be, you have to begin to visualize and plan projects with this, uh, this multiple ethos in mind. Not in order to make a hybrid right, thing, right, right. but in order to, to engage in a process where if people are going, going to understand that their interests are being addressed in a project, they have to see what they're desiring. Just like if you're an architect designing a house. So let me just say one more thing. The important thing uh, I want to say is that our, the role of designers and experts in this is not to ask people in the public process what they want is to go in and, under, and try to understand what they know about where they live. Uh, and the second thing is um, that, and I think Armando, if he, would show the, if he was able to show the pictures from this book, uh, we would see a lot of this. And even the kind of sensible city work you're hearing about is not so much always projecting a different future, which is eventually necessary, but actually being able to see the city as it is before you project an alternate, right? Good, good point. I mean, I was going to, the reason I went to you af after uh, David is, is exactly this, that it seems that there is a much more real-time technological solution to thoughts that I know yeah. you were having. What's the situation, what's the scenario we're working in? Right. right? What are the actual, yeah. inter what's yeah. a map of the actual <clears throat> interests right now? Yeah. Iran, I, this is this is very much in your wheelhouse. Yeah, I, I think I'll just add uh, two things. I, I, <clears throat> I think what, as David mentioned, and Armando, uh, I see the technology and the information in three areas, what I call uh, cognition, collaboration, and creativity. Mm -hmm. So the cognition is really understanding the city, as uh, we just said, and what is going on right now. Um, one of the things that is difficult, and I think that we have talked about in the afternoon session, is that most people don't visualize uh, the way architects and designers do. Uh, and even for us as designer, go take a zoning regulation and try to understand right, right, right. what it means in three dimensions. Good right. luck. Even right. the lawyers, I think, don't get it. Right. Right. So the question is how new technology and what kind of interfaces, which I think we are building those and there's great future in that, could actually allow us to model and simulate those regulations, those codes, or even those visions that the public have in real time. Right. And that's right. still a right. challenge. So. Even though we heard the story about a camera and about you know, the walkthrough that a particular development uh, might have, what happens if you're in a public session and somebody says, well, what happens if you actually change that building? And then you say, wait a minute, I have to go to my office right, and right, work right. on the AutoCAD and come back with a new model. But I think we are getting into a point that we can do it actually in real time. So that's one thing that is very promising in terms of, as I say, both collaboration and cognition of uh, uh, what's happening around us. The other thing is, as I said, is a little bit uh, the issue of creativity. And does the uh, technology that we have right now allow us to collaborate even between professionals and actually get better results? Uh, we have done some experiments at MIT and others with students, and I think, that, again, there are uh, promising venues that we see that. And even in the way that we operate, that it's not anymore in the old traditional uh, two-dimensional screen with a mouse and a keyboard that actually people work in very, in a mo almost old-fashioned way of, of, of interaction with objects and models that are actually connected to um, urban simulation. And by even sitting, not the way we sit right now, which is another thing to think about in public uh, presentation often, there is the experts that sits here and the public there, and the, even the way, and although you break into those sessions, but even the way that you could operate in a public session uh, together with some of this digital uh, information that actually allow people even to feel, even if it's psychological, that they actually are part of the decision-making process, mm -hmm. that change a lot of the dynamics. So those are just a couple of things that uh, I'll mm -hmm. add into that. Right, right. Justin, you look like you Yeah, I just want to kind of respond to that. Um, the, in many ways, we need to, in terms of challenging the, the problems of the process, to rethink what planners, designers do. and and. I think to kind of follow up on the point of the gentleman up there, that, that um, in many ways we're trying to mine, do a better job of mining the public knowledge mm. so that the projects that we're proposing or the plans we're trying to implement, um, that they're consistent with some sort of a, a, a public sensibility. Um, and so, yeah, so visualization technology can go a really long way in, in helping to guide 
that. Well, I, I want to press you just a little bit on that because you know we we see with David and, and just David, you're you're playing the role as an expert and a placeholder for a collection of technological innovations. I think that allow us to see lots of things sort of in real time, which kind of changes our ability to think about about a, 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 you know a lot of elements of this process and. Um, you know, you, you write a lot about, about policy and about, uh, uh, I mean, what kind of an impact do you see these kinds of technologies making in, because policy, as we found out on the last panel, policy remains usually in a very different place than where designers would think it ought to be by now. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? In other words, that, that, that uh, people who think about this stuff a lot from a physical perspective are, are, are often depressed at the kind of static uh, level of policy decisions. I wonder if how you think these kinds of technologies are going to influence that. Is that a reasonable question? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that the answer is they're, they're very positive. It's, it's, um, it's about looking at the current kind of policy planning framework that exists that controls the, the development scheme and to say that it's, it's not very effective and that, that there is room for technology. So right here in the city of Boston, um, the mayor's office of new urban mechanics, mm -hmm. I think is what it's called. And, and I mean, I met with these guys and I mean, I feel like they're, they see themselves as a think tank. Mm -hmm. they're, they know that what they do <laughs> is imperfect and they're looking to spend money and invest in technologies um, and to try to try to make a difference in, in the way that, that they implement their rules and that they run their business. Yeah, and George, I want to sure. just chime in here for a second too because the, the notion of partnership I think is very important in terms of what these technologies can, can offer. I mean, I would love it if the developer were not the enemy anymore right, 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 in right. the process. And it wasn't the community against the developer and you're negotiating and the government is negotiating. I think these technologies provide a language where everybody can sit on the same side of the table and talk about what are the issues, what are the trade-offs, how do we do all this and do it at a profit right. for everyone right, and a right. profit that's broadly defined. It's right, not just right. the money. It's the quality of life and the amenities and everything else that everybody wants. Right. Well, you know, I think I think if if, if uh, Byron Rushing were here as he was for the morning panel, you know, this this arc. There's a reason we started this the, the, these, these uh, panels in the '60s because the that collaborative, uh, if I could say, utopia that yeah. you just described, um, <laughs> it, it, it is a long way from where this started. Right. Um, you know, uh, Anthony Flint. Uh, would describe the, 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 the battleground between uh, Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses as being not collaborative. <laughs> um, and and I, 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 too, am very encouraged, but it's gonna, it, it, we're going to have to be persuaded by these technologies or other means that allow us to see very clearly um, our interests, our current actions, um, you know, if current trends continue, this is where things will go and so forth. Somehow, um, we not only have to develop those technologies, but make this universally visible. Uh, and this is part of the, this is part of the challenge. Um, so that that becomes the, f the factual basis uh, of, of, of subsequent conversations. I, you know, I too have been very involved in a lot of uh, BRA processes uh, in, in, in different contexts. Um, and it's certainly a lot better than, than a lot of other places. Um, but the, 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 the flaws in the existing <coughs> enterprise, um, in term, not necessarily in terms of getting a good building done here or there, but in terms of mapping th this larger agenda, and certainly Richard Summer is exactly right that even if a few good projects get done in the city, um, the regional, our, our, our ability to address regional issues remains very, very, very Right, to think weak. territorially. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it be, re, remains very, very weak. And so, um, I mean, this is a, you, you know, I share that interest in, in, in developing um, tools that, that communities, uh, developers, and regional planners can all uh, use equally. Let me, let me just uh, ask Ellen Liu here for a second. Ellen, I know you're from, from San Francisco and that you've done work in China, but perhaps the most um, challenging environment, at least that I hear from my friends in San Francisco, is getting a building built in San Francisco. Um, how, tell us a little bit about how that process works uh, in San Francisco and, 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 and what, if anything, you guys do at SOM to try to 
uh, make it move forward. Yes, uh, just now I heard, I think the project was approved in two years and 68 public meetings. We're going through a project, I think on average we were told the, uh, not, uh, we know, uh, to, get a planning um, put, to get a project approved and title is three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And we have a project that we've done 225 public meetings and we are not done yet. <laughs> so, yeah. right. um, I think San Francisco in some ways, I don't know exactly, it sounds very similar to Boston in the sense that many things we do uh, will mean some changes to zoning. Thus, it brings the need for environmental impact assessment, we call CEQA, the California Environmental um, Act, uh, Quality Act. So when you have the CEQA process, you not only have to do the public process, but you have a legal process that you have to go through. And that process is held hostage by, I don't know, it could be opposition proponents, whoever. And uh, so it's, um, you know, we will start with pre-consultations, whatever, and then go through tons of meetings. And then with both the interest group stakeholders, regional, local, neighborhood, your, whoever you can think about. And then um, even before the, the environmental process is going, even before you start filing uh, your, your, your application. And then when the application starts, then you start also you know, the um, approvals and also environmental process. And then the environmental process has the team to call for you know, formal public meetings, approvals, and reviews. And so we have these two layers, you know, the, the outreach part, and then you have the CEQA process, and then you go for the approval. Now, but has, has, has SOM developed any, um, any uh, technological ways to try to improve the communication in that enterprise? Because it, you know, I think actually Boston and San Francisco are very similar in this way. They're perhaps among the most contested cities in the country. They're, uh, they're, they're limited by water on many sides. Uh, almost any site is, is, is contested. Almost every development is a zero-sum enterprise, all, all of that. Um, but um, it, do you guys use, is it, is it all just you know, sort of traditional uh, uh, public meetings one-on-one -on -one or small groups with small groups, or do you use technology to try to advance the process at all? Or, to visualize for, for your audiences? Yeah, in many ways, I to totally agree. The way to model and illustrate the future is a really good one. But when do you use it and how do you use it? Um, it's a lot of art because you don't want to go out and show some computer simulation before the community tells you mm -hmm. their concerns and issues. On the other hand, you do want to illustrate to them you know, various <coughs> options and possibilities. It depends on Really, it comes back to whether this is a public project, which we work on a lot, right. or for the developer, which has certain clear objectives. Different formats for those. Yes, yes. Those so animals. we use, you know, for instance, we have a computer model of the whole San Francisco. Right. So we can illustrate the implication of, say, one building, so a group of buildings that we're proposing for the city, right. or where the city is going to grow and how does it mean. And then as a study tool for, you know, um, because it's not only the general public. I mean, we do have agencies and other stakeholders that we have to go through the process. We illustrate those. Um, we also find it very helpful in some public project that you do scenario building. It's, it's more like an education process. You start with the input and then show them if you do this, this is what it means, GIS, presentation, whatever. Um, but it's a real art. I would not say um, uh, it's a static answer right now because the the public also learn what's useful and what to expect. So sometimes well, you're not ready yet and they already want all kind of stuff. Right, right. <laughs> well, we, I think we definitely want to get to, in a minute, this um, uh, sort of existential question on, about the use of technology in, in planning, which is, um, okay, you can make it as transparent as you, as, as you want to. Now, how, how transparent do you want to make it? Let's, let's ask that in a second. <laughs> uh, because Jim, James Minor, uh, you guys at Sasaki have developed some software for use initially with private clients, if I'm yep, not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah. And that, but you're evolving it into something that might work in a, in a more in a public setting, and maybe even as a planning tool. Is that yeah, right? and actually, we owe we owe Iran a, uh, a thanks for actually we hired one of his best students about ten years ago to ah. do just that, which is to develop software tools. Mm. And I would say one of the biggest changes to our planning practice in the past ten years is that we're hiring people to write code now because we're really trying to ramp up our efforts in these visualiza visualization tools to. Really, in, initially, the idea was, uh, let's develop a tool that, uh, in the hands of a designer, you can sketch in real time and see 
program accommodation and you can tie it to a developer's pro forma. This was five years ago when that kind of work was really where we were at. Uh, but that's really evolved. Um, we realized that once we had that platform available to us, we could tie other metrics to it. I think one of the challenges as planners and designers as we go into a public process is that we want to talk about design. Um, it's the rare community member that wants to debate design. And somehow we've got zoning in the middle as the thing that's going to mediate between what they're interested in, which is quality of life, uh, and what we're trying to promote, which is good design, and then how we actually manifest that through buildings and places right. and spaces. So what we could do and what we've been trying to do is tie some of those metrics uh, to design. So what's the impact of a design on your tax bill? What does that mean for your schools? Mm -hmm. um, how does it affect water use in the community, uh, energy consumption? All of those things are the things that the community cares about. And then, then if you can give those tools to them rather than just showing them and have them manipulate models and understand the impacts of design decisions, it kind of gets at the issues that they care about and you come out with something hopefully that achieves uh, mutual benefit. Right. Now, do you find, uh, do you find that um, you use this software mostly in, um, not in dense urban settings, but in like, uh, in, in a development in a, in, a, in, a, in a suburb of Boston or something like that? Well, the, the ideal situation is that it's scalable, of course, so it can apply to different situations. And right. we've done it at multiple scales where in one case you may be wanting to look at rainwater and how that is, is handled on a, on a city all the way up to the scale of a new community of thousands of, of, of Wait, people. The reason, so I the, ask, are the reason I ask is that the, um, you know, when you, having thought about this some myself, the, the um, when, you, when you're in a, a city that has a lot of different neighborhoods, for example, that might have very different interests, yeah. it's, 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 very, it's much more complicated than if you're doing it, let's say you have a town and, 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 and the vast majority of citizens would rank the same four variables as the key thing, yeah. right? Because let's say, whatever it is, we don't want any kids because we don't have to build a school. And you have, to, you have an ethical yeah. choice about whether or not you're going to... Yeah, well, I think the, thing, next, but... the next frontier is really on regional planning, and that's where the opportunity lies. Right. There's some really interesting things going on uh, with the HUD grant program, HUD DOT, for the Sustainable Communities Challenge Grants, and a lot of regions are trying to figure out what that means for them. Mm -hmm. And through scenario modeling, you can try, I think, with some of these new tools to get people out of their frame of reference. So let's say I, as a member of a community, really care about social equity. Well, what does that mean for transportation? Uh, you, can, you can then have a list of projects, you can take comprehensive plans from varieties of communities and say, okay, we're all competing for very limited resources, and if we change our value sets in the following ways, here are the projects that rise to the top. So we can, we can look at goal setting and not just at kind of place making as a way of, yeah, of achieving that's, design. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Curtis, you do work in the city, but you also do work in, 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 in suburbs. Do you find um, that the, that the approvals process is wildly different in those situations? Or? No. I mean, Wellesley is a lot like Boston. Um, you know, there's a lot of contention. There are a lot of competing needs. Uh, people don't want density. They don't want multifamily, which is what I do. They don't want to burden the schools. They don't want to burden the water and the sewer system. And so you end up having the same fights. And it's, um, it's a slightly different language. The people uh, downtown tend to be a little bit more direct in their feedback right, than the right, people right. in the suburbs. Right, right, right. Um, but the feedback is the same. Right, right. You know? Right. So I think, again, it's, it's what I'm looking for is how do we not make it a fight? Right. You know, is there some way for us to make it more of a, a conversation based on data, based on modeled outcomes, based on consequences, like where's your trash really going and what do we want to do about that, you know? And I'm sort of in between uh, the customer and my investor. And those two constituencies, you know, I'm trying to not just build what I like, um, well, that's important, but I'm really trying to build what's right for the customer. That's where it starts and ends for me and something that gives a return on my capital. And so that, that's the place where, you know, if I could have a rational conversation with all the constituencies that are around how do we optimize that, then I, I, that would help me. Well, let me, let, me, let me posit a scenario then for you, which is... Um, because I, I, my intuition tells me that this might very well happen. If we can map data better, if we can understand our um, current situation and our desires and everything more clearly and you know, against using common data, um, we're basically sort of repricing everything. We're trying to put accurate prices on things because there's perhaps some 
some things that have hidden subsidies, other things that don't and so forth. What if the consequence of this greater transparency is that you know, development costs go way up and, and, and your market shrinks? I mean, that, you know, that, it seems to me that one of the consequences of this greater clarity is going to be that we're going to realizing that we're going to realize that we're sort of underpaying for some things and maybe overpaying for others. And I mean, I think that's going to be an interesting conversation. Um, and I am convinced that because of work that's being done in modeling um, and tying it to a lot of metrics, and James, exactly as you're saying, you can once you get good sort of streaming data in it, uh, that changes, you know, that's changing, so that your cost of construction costs are changing, your borrowing costs are changing real estate costs are changing, and so forth. You can really start to see what the consequences of actions are. And I, I just think that I asked you just because we're. Yeah, no, you're, and you're, I, I'm happy to answer it because I say, great. You know, it, it sort of, it takes some of the mystery out of it. Right. And also it takes a lot of the uh, uh, sort of wild guessing right. out of it, which is what most of us are doing most of the time. Right, 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 right. And it, I think to the extent that we can have real information and real data, you know, let me just choose an example of, um, you know, younger customers today, they're green, okay? Now, for a long time, people were trying to say, do leads development, Curtis. Right. You're, you're going to, you know, save money. Well, when you really look at that and you start shopping for leads points, what ends up happening is your construction costs actually go up. And a lot of times, your operating costs go up. And it doesn't really pay for a very, 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 very long time. But now, <coughs> with younger customers, it's not just a cost saving equation, it's a revenue generation equation, right? Where younger customers are saying, I want to live in a green building and I'm willing to pay more in rent or I'm willing to pay more for a condo if my lifestyle is green. Well now, if that data is transparent, as a developer right, right. I can say, gee, you know what? Maybe I should actually develop something green right. because I'm getting a revenue bump and a potential cost increase that's right. more than covered. Wow, this could make sense. So I think those are the kind of conversations that you can have for real, right. instead of having them kind of in a black black box kind sure. of environment. Absolutely, Richard. So uh, I mean, I think that's a great example. But I want to insist that the city uh, and planning and redesigning the city beyond the scale of a building or a particular places. It's a complex process. The city's a complex organism. And for example, we're not going to solve the problem of energy use and the carbon footprint at the scale of a building and make, making its, its uh, technologies more green. It's a more systemic problem. Well, uh, okay. both. Let's, okay. let's say well, both. Well, you have to do both. Uh, we, we, you, One you, is easy, much easier. You have, to link, you have to link the faucet to the watershed, for example. We're just talking about water, OK? Um, uh, because the, 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 you, and we can do that for every, every system. Uh, and in the last panel, this discussion came up about uh, about investment in mass transit, or or about the lack the lack of um, uh, of funding. And in fact, around issues of human health and sustainability, we we ha we go around and around about these conversations. But without a bigger systemic look and a bigger, bigger systemic research on redesigning the city around these issues, we're not going to get there. We're not we're not going to get there incrementally. So what 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 I think is important. Um, to say about, uh, I think it's important to make a distinction between design, research, and uh, uh, research on the city, research on the form of the city, uh, the mapping of, of, of political interests uh, as one area of activity, and the other are these tools and technologies of engagement. Uh, because you're talking about a kind of space of, 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 of um, engagement with people around having them understand what possible futures are. But before you enter that room, there is a certain amount of vetting and clearing of data and development of, all, of alternatives that has to happen somewhere. And the state isn't, the state isn't supporting right. it. So, but so David, I, I, David's yeah. doing that for us. Yeah. Well, one, universities, yes, yeah. are a place where we would hope that would happen, but not yet enough. Well, but, but one of the consequences <laughs> I would hope of, this, of a <clears throat> conference like this is to see is to help us think about what we ought to be doing because right, I, right. because I completely agree that you know when when universities uh, uh, try and, and especially universities that are really interested in engaging the world uh, try to simply mimic the professional world that would be a disastrous yes. choice instead we need to provide value that isn't getting generated elsewhere yeah. so I, I absolutely agree I mean uh, one is university the other thing is the fact that we have this data and we have the power now to actually model those very complex scenarios on regional mm -hmm. and absolutely you know you absolutely right in that. It's not about, I mean, a lot of discussion, the, 
first session was about a particular building, or almost isolated site in Boston, and really the, the whole world doesn't operate that way. So uh, go to China, right? Go to, to South America, go holes. see, go to, you know. So the, the idea is that we have now the capacity to do some of this analysis and to do some of this scenario building uh, just because of the, te the technology is advancing. Uh, who is going to do it? I think that's a big question. That's, a, right. that's right. I mean, university is one. Uh, nonprofit is others. I don't think government, some are doing it, but it doesn't tend to be in the United States. I think there's more interest of in doing it in places like Japan, right. even in China right sure, now. Sure, sure. Uh, but those at least are models that when we are engaged with those, we can let, later on try to apply them here in the United States. I just wanted one more thing about universities because doing of universities in the first <laughs> session about ru university ruining uh, cities. Um, we, but, didn't, we didn't take it seriously, yeah. but go ahead. <laughs> uh, but I, I do want to mention that it's, you know, technology is not the panacea. You know, it's, it's one thing, and there's a lot of things that actually take a lot of uh, human labor and love. And, uh, and I just want to mention the, the role of universities and what we do, whether it's in planning and architecture in our fields, to actually be engaged in community and provide that missing link that some of most of you are, I mean, I think most of us here in this panel are in academia, so I'll take, I'll take the liberty to say that, that it is our job to actually help Engage with the communities, engage with uh, places that do not have the ability to hire uh, the professionals to actually represent them. And I think a lot of us are doing that. And the other thing I want to say why I'm optimistic is that I think that a lot of the students that are coming, the new generation, is very much engaged with those kind of issues. And they are engaged uh, both in terms of the environmental uh, consideration, impact, but also in terms of the social. And we see some kind of uh, and uh, I think a growing interest that we might have se seen before in the 1960s. But what also they're doing is they're going out there, they're not finding jobs. And so what they do in the regular Sasaki, although Sasaki is hiring, but in some other uh, typical firms, and they're forming their own firms where they're using some of this technology to actually help us mitigate in that interface. So I've seen a lot of students that come out and you know they, they form open plans, for example, is a, you can find a lot of these on the internet is really they do try to make money, but they say to the community, we will help you uh, actually visualize, engage, and be the in-between and the negotiator right. between you and the developers. This is, this is interesting for on, on, on a couple of reasons. I have to keep us focused, but, but the, um, the business about, you know, our institution is very interested in, in urban engagement and has been for a while. But uh, a distinction that I've always uh, felt the need to make is between um, with, uh, helping out systemically as an academic institution, that is taking a problem that is endemic to an urban area and providing research or data or value that cannot be done otherwise, and simply, um, I don't know, uh, out, the outreach of goodwill. <laughs> Uh, and I and I I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm I'm inferring from what you're saying that you're talking about the former. You're talking about trying to. Uh, I mean, some of your graduates may um, directly engage with a community and say, "Our primary job is to actually help you, community X, achieve your goals." But it, it seems to me that the and, and I'm just trying to make sure I understand you that the um, uh, that providing the sort of intellectual infrastructure to be able to do this and the judgment and. Uh, <coughs> Is something that, that, that maybe the universities can, can help um, out most with. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we're also doing it through just simple engagement in studios and workshop doing right. teaching. So uh, I think, again, remember, we could be an, an interesting leverage in between because we don't represent, if we go and work right now in the Bronx, for example, I don't represent, I'm not elected there, I'm not running right, for right, office, right, right. and I don't get paid. So right. it's, a, it's an interesting way by which we could be, as a university or an academic institution, um, and in, in, in between, between you actually go and hire a professional to, and so this, that, that's kind of the opportunity. Oh, I totally, I totally agree. The idea of an architecture yeah. student, let's just say, one of our students going to the Bronx and saying, hi, I'm here to, I've, I'm ready to start designing the solution to your problem, that's one thing. We do, right. schools have been doing that for a long time to modest benefit. Um, and, and uh, but the alternative that of, of building some uh, tools that anybody could, could be able to map their interests around better and understand their situation better. I think it's something I totally agree with. Armando, yeah, I think. I, I want to yeah, pick up on this idea of uh, connection between the, uh, the public accessibility uh, uh, to the process and, and to the information and transparency and so forth and the research side of this. Because I, I don't actually see this as a huge <coughs> divide necessarily. And uh, I recall from the previous session this idea that you know, a building could get better better as a result of the public review process because there was some 
maturing of thought about it during that process. There was some learning. And you know, I, I think there could be a, a joint learning process around the analysis. The, I mean, I have to sell a couple more things. We have a book on planning <laughs> support systems for cities and regions that will be available. And uh, this really talks about the, the sort of analytical tools that are out there to make you know, big models of big regions to, to try to analyze uh, future uh, scenarios. But by uh, making those available, by uh, making this a two-way street and incorporating uh, feedback into the analysis, you, you kind of make the whole thing work together. And uh, I just a couple of other thoughts that haven't come up, but it, it, it relates to the software development idea. We've gotten very interested in the idea of open source uh, planning tools. And, and part of this is that lots of uh, innovative and creative people are building their own tools, but keeping them you know, fairly closely held. And what is the future of those tools? Well, some of them may thrive, but some of them may uh, die off for, for lack of uh, support. And uh, we, we see potential in a, a more of a community of software developers uh, and, and helping them find some ways to get the kind of financial support that's making this thing work. But uh, one of the projects that came out of the, uh, the HUD sustainability grants, uh, over $5 million to uh, University of Utah, uh, is going to be building on open source uh, uh, simulation tools, some of which we, we've worked on uh, with Fraganesian Associates, and it's exactly the kind of thing we were hoping would be stimulated by uh, this this new source of, uh, of grant money. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that I've learned as I've started to look at what other firms are doing out there, we're not we're not so unique actually. I mean, at Sasaki, we've done some really wonderful things, but as much, as great as we might think we are, uh, this is what everybody's doing. Fraganesian is doing, it. and there are lots of actually smaller groups coming out of universities who are doing just this, looking at scenarios. And I think the key to innovation, and this is really about the academic spirit, is, is to share constantly. Mm -hmm. It keeps you on the cutting edge because you're constantly sharing what you've got. Um, and so I think the idea of a collaborative relationship with the institutions and trying to figure this out is probably a more efficient way to go given that we're all trying to figure it out independently as, it, as we are, so. Alan, you would you would. Oh, okay. yes, I, I just wanted to sort of add to the part that we are all trying to promote ideas and, you know, the community participation or outreach is trying to get them involved and engaged, but as professionals or developers or whoever, we are still, we kind of play that lead role in terms of coming out with good design, good planning ideas, good vision, be more green, and then we use these tools to illustrate and communi communicate and educate the public. Well, so isn't, it, isn't it the case though, Ellen, that, there's, that we're talking about two different kinds of tools here in a way? One are those that, will, that reveal and help us sort out behaviors we're already engaged in or, 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 or ways we're already living or values that we already hold and so forth. And another one is, is a newer generation of representation tools of the kind we've maybe used before. Is that a reasonable distinction? Because I, I think it's true. Like when you talk about a, a digital three-dimensional model of San Francisco, it is a better and more flexible evolution of the uh, basswood model of downtown Boston, and, pro that has, and there's probably an a analogous one in San Francisco that has been in the mayor's office for, right? For, at the university. Or at the university <laughs> for 40 yeah. years. So I think they're two different things uh, in a way. Let me get to David and then. Yeah. And then. Okay, uh, so there are several threads here I wanted to pick up on. Um, one is this idea of transparency, and, and I believe that technology, if you do it right, it will make good work or good projects more attractive than uh, bad work less attractive, and it's going to clarify a lot of these trade-offs that are inherent in any project, especially something like building energy efficiency. It's going to make that incredibly transparent, and it makes the lead building, or it doesn't have to be lead, it can just be a well-functioning building that much more attractive, because you can see it. Uh, I wanted to plug one more project uh, from that long list. is right. uh, uh, Live Singapore or Live Singapore? I think Live is actually the better word, because it is looking at uh, aggregating real-time data from many existing sources. It's kind of inspired by the New York City Big Apps competition, where the city opened up a lot of data sources to the public um, and encouraged people to build apps around them. So we're talking about anyone from a software company to a student, uh, a high school student who programs in a spare time can build apps using this public data. Right. And you can do things like find the best schools for your kids or receive a text message if you've stepped into a restaurant that got a C on its last inspection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this that's very cool. nice. So, I mean, there's already great creativity around these existing uh, data sources, but now we are looking, at, actually, Life Singapore just launched today. They have 
an immense amount of real-time data streaming in from uh, water and power, from taxi companies, from telecommunications companies, uh, weather and traffic management. And part of the, the challenge is how do you encourage uh, the agencies to open this up and see the short-term benefit in some of these really useful, like funny, cute little applications that everyone's going to download for two bucks. But also, uh, it's, it's kind of a Trojan horse because in the long run, that data is also going to be open to the public and invite a lot of scrutiny. I, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a question, though, on that front, which is, um, you know, I, uh, who doesn't love, in the age of the iPhone and everything else, um, the apps that you can get that just, you know, when you see them, you say, oh my god, I can't believe nobody thought of that before. An alarm that goes off when you go into a bad restaurant. I've wanted that my whole life. So, uh, you know, obviously there are needs that are being met. But um, on the other hand, when, you're, when this is about cross-pollinating information, that's where the real value comes from, right? Is not just, because you really don't just want to know, and you could have known other ways if you're only asking about water use, for example, there are other ways to get that information. What's useful about having it all be digital and have it all be real time is the prospect now of cross-pollinating the information. We can all agree with about yes. that. So how do we then, or is it unreasonable to expect that we might, I mean, it's, it's very easy to imagine um, quantifying uh, data like water usage or thermal performance of a building skin or something like this. It's a lot less obvious to think about how you, how you quantify in this same machine um, the quality of a street edge or some of these other things that when, it come, when push comes to shove, when you really want to triangulate that data to get at, at large answers, it, it's much harder to quantify. Have, have, have you or others you work with tried to address some of that stuff? Well, I think that's the reason why it's really important for like, our lab and, and many similar technology startups to engage with the planning community. Because while the quantitative skills are there to measure things like crime statistics, uh, uh, traffic congestion, things like that, uh, it's still tough to ask the right questions. Right. What does that actually mean? Right. Is right. the safety of the city actually uh, an indicator of a good public right. space? Even though, like, even though I would like to go to a restaurant that, that serves uncontaminated food at which I will not be shot and where I can park, it still <laughs> might not be the ideal community. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, it speaks to the fact that planning is uh, not entirely, to some, but to some extent, uh, an empirical art, but uh, the designing of the city is, not, is often a projective art. So that does not necessarily give us the tools right. to design, to either redesign or design a street, right. for example. Right. 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 Uh, and so I guess... Can it give uh, us the tools to quantify better the quality of existing... It can help stuff. us write the program. It can, in, in reverse, it can help us analyze what, 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 what right. we put forward, but it, it, it it's does not, not do necessarily give the form, and right, I, right. I, I want to insist on that. And I also, while I don't... Uh, and, and, uh, and, um, uh, I, I don't want to disagree with, with, with the notion that, um, that engagement with, with various publics can, can make a, a project smarter. And, and better, but I think it's important at this time to ask the question of what constitutes expertise in the field of remaking, remaking the city. Because when you go to a meeting and someone has Google Earth and has done their own version of it, right. and you right. spent your life looking at cities and right. understanding the way that you know complex projects are putting together, you're not you know you're you're, you're not talking uh, apples and apples. Right. 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 Yet right. you know if I look at the expertise array on this table and I I include the two gentlemen in the front from the last panel, right. the question I think you know and I and I and I know uh, with 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 the knowledge and expertise from the development and the engineering and all the sides that exist here that we could do an amazing project. But the, so the question is really, how do you design not the project, but the, the process of making a project uh, uh, to get these larger issues? Because this is, I think you mentioned earlier, is the challenge of today, because there is no complex urban problem to which one expert, whether it's architect, engineer, community activist, has That's the answer. Uh, some have uh, more answers for certain parts of the project. And it's not only that, how you connect that with the political structure that, that gives it agency right. is, I think, the challenge of today, is really designing how to do projects that, 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 that address more than one place or one, one specific issue. Right. Yeah, the, the, the planning design community still needs to have a leadership role. We don't mm -hmm. want to advocate that leadership mm -hmm. role. But it's a matter of just kind of rethinking that relationship a little bit more. Um, there's just a page I want to take from the world of TV and entertainment. Um, the founder of SimCity, I believe his name is Will Wright, he, he came up with this idea to rethink how they should make TV shows. That the writers are still going to be driving it, but they're going to have a website so that 
people who watch the show can kind of comment and say, oh, maybe you know, this man and woman should get together or they should, you know, there should be a, a problem. So, so to make it an interactive process. But do you think that'll be funnier than Curb Your Enthusiasm? <laughs> <laughs> really? I don't know. Yeah, no, it, I mean, but this is, no, this, is, this is the key question, though, Which about... Which is dominated by one person with a crazy mind, right? Right, 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 right. Let's so George, that's, George. that's exactly what I'm interested in talking about, is the community has some reaction, say, for 300 feet high buildings, but it takes the leadership of the planning and design community to figure out that there are actually other issues, other ways to solve the same problem about height or traffic. And then you use different tools to model and communicate with. Them. It's to it's totally true, though. I uh, though I think we all, all know, and I'm, I know this is true in San Francisco because I have friends there who tell me the same thing, which is um, that in the perverse <coughs> world of the review process today, where I, in San Francisco and in Boston, um, we, we've been already told more than once it's parking and height. Uh, there's probably a couple other variables, but that's 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 really so. You see uh, the Lever House. <laughs> And I, in the community, I just see uh, a tall building, and, and I don't know where there people are There's a third park. component. There's the historical character of the place. Right, 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 right. right. So. Well, and there's a fourth component, which is, <laughs> which is you can design fabulous things. And all, yeah. all of my fellow panelists here are very smart and capable people. Um, but you have to do it at a profit. Mm. Yes. So if you want, if, if we're going to get public funding to build great cities, fabulous. Don't worry about it. You know, there's sort of, you, you don't have to worry about the profit. Well, it turns out we still do have to worry about it. But, but if, if you want <laughs> private developers who, who are the ones who are really developing the cities to be able to get the capital to develop those cities and, and, and work not only at a city level, but at a system level, which mm -hmm. I agree is also important when you ra raise it a level up, although I think the public has to See that. participate yeah. in that more. Public money has to do that because I can't solve that problem. Of course. But on a city basis, I just think one of the variables in all of your brilliant models and technology has to be profit. Mm -hmm. And that can't be a bad thing. It's got to be a good thing right. where when you engage the person in the community and they're saying, I see you're packing your site and it's too tall and it's too big and it's too dense and it's got parking, you say, well, fine, I'm willing to do less, right. but make sure that I'm doing something less at a profit. Yeah. And let's balance those two interests appropriately. Oh, I, 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 Curtis, I, I think I completely agree. And I, I would say it probably goes without saying that those of us who have been uh, advocating for mapping, the clearer mapping, the more transparent mapping of all this information, recognize, and I would say whether, frankly, whether it's a public or a private project, having the cost consequence as part of that equation seems essential. Regard, you know what I mean? It's a spe certainly it's essential for you. Not just cost. Profit. Profit. Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's the return on equity. It's sure. the return sure. on cost. That's, that's the key is how, what, are we getting enough profit to be able to attract the money to actually do Touche. I agree. I, I don't think, I, I don't. I, I know you do. I'm I just can't imagine anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but, but isn't that also a matter of uh, contestation, right? So I, I know in San Francisco at one time at least, uh, the city was pretty good at running pro formas on projects to figure out how much profit was in them to figure out how big the exaction should be. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, this could work both ways. You're right. Yeah. Well, well That's part of the risk. <laughs> what, what is certainly true is, and it, and it is certainly true that in Boston, I can't speak for San Francisco, but I'm sure it's the same way, um, there is a sizable contingent of people who are very involved in the review process who don't think real estate <laughs> should make profits at all. And I mean, that's a perfectly, it's, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But when you have uh, 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 sort of little uh, en mapping engines that explain how what your actual choices are, I think that I think that contingent will have a less will, will be less vocal because it thrives on not understanding fully um, what the choices are. It seems exactly. To me. Or I mean, that's just my opinion. But the fact is, my opinion wouldn't matter. But the the when you see the interrelationship of the data, you will see that things cost something and that profit is necessary to make. Projects but, but if we're going to talk about the role of international finance and, 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 and capital in, in building cities, which is, you know, the mainstay of what's building cities now, uh, we really have to get into these issues of how much it is affecting the design of cities. So I've been, you know, living and uh, learning about Toronto in the last few years, and it's one place where, in North America, where, where they're still building a lot. Um, and what's been happening there is most of the construction, what they call uh, intensification, which is the word we like to use for density now, is in, is in building uh, condominiums uh, in the center of the city, some of which are very beautifully designed. And they seem to be getting smaller and smaller. 
and there are uh, more and more glass. So the units get smaller, and there, there's more glass. And so I kept, you know, I kept sort of asking, the, uh, I know a lot of developers, I talked to them, you know, what's going on there? Well, um, the building of the city and these, these buildings are not being driven so much by the local community or the market, but by the, the international investment market, because Toronto is still a good value to invest in, and people are bundling units and uh, real estate based on based on what can what can be what can be turned over more quickly. So it, ha it ha sometimes has very that has little. That has to be a function of the local market, though, too. No. Uh, well, it's being turned over in Toronto. Yes. Uh, so so you have you have people renting these small apartments, which are you know coming out of school. Uh, uh, but there's there's market there's market for uh, other kinds of units. They're not being built as much because because the international investment market it, it sees less security in that. Right. Right. So I think there is that, you know, if we're going to make the system transparent, uh, you, we, we would see. And if you looked at the way in which um, you know real estate and real estate investment trusts and other things are actually driving the form of cities. And, and, uh, and sometimes in <laughs> extremely intelligent, kind of, uh, you know, fascinating ways. But, but it, it is not, uh, it, this is about why the discussion today is a little odd, because we're always talking about, you know, what the community wants and what the people next door want. But that's actually not what's often driving mm -hmm. what's being built and where it's being built. And also, what, and also the, uh, the other forces that we hope to see some of these development uh, projects answer, which, are, <clears throat> which go beyond the immediate, uh, address issues beyond the immediate vicinity. Or why businesses are locating outside of cities and they're building housing in but, the city but, but because of land costs. But wouldn't it be the cost, case? Right? Is it too is it too optimistic <clears throat> to say that if you have a, a transparent enough model of mm -hmm. what is causing uh, uh, prices and sizes and, and shape of the city, that you can um, then have a clearer idea of when it is in the public interest to subsidize something or not? In other words, we don't. If we if we in Toronto do not like the fact that that the international market is making more housing for single people because it's easier to turn over and we think there should be more apartments for families well that you know I mean, whether it's a political choice but at least you could see the space in which to exercise so here's choice. a perverse example from San Francisco because San Francisco has gone in the direction of not allowing developers to build par parking with its new housing units. In order to encourage family housing, they're giving the developers uh, the bonus of being able to build parking in their projects if they'll build family units. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, so that's a, uh, you know, in the, so, in the, so, in the strange so. world of incentives, there's a, there's a new one. Yeah, I guess maybe just a couple sure. of things that sure, sure. Uh, Richard said and to bring it back. Um, about the process, and I think it was discussed um, a little bit before, the pre-process, and we, again, concentrating about the process with the public sector, but I think a lot of the things we need to also think about is the collaboration and how some of these tools help actually the various professionals. Mm -hmm. None of us work in That's a vacuum, great. whether you're an architect, landscape architect, engineer, traffic engineer. And so what are those tools and how, and this is where I think I, when I said creativity, I, we found that there's more collaboration and creativity in this sector. But it doesn't, when we, when we actually work uh, together uh, on a project, maybe before we bring it to the public, the big issue, and I think it was also brought in the last session to me, is are we at the end, and I think it goes back to what you said, making better places with all of this digital information, with all of these tools, at the end of the road, are the places we design any better than what we did 60 years ago when we did have computer and we worked with a trace and a pencil? And well, I'm all, not always sure that that's the... That, that we have it. And that's one thing we are missing. We are missing really an evaluation. We love to look at all of these small things, but we're not looking back and saying, let's look at what is actually being constructed. And the same thing, we don't do a very good job at actually looking at success stories of the processes. So if there is a good process like we discussed last time, and things are working well, as we said, and the building or the project is wonderful, why aren't we actually recording it and understanding how that works? We always have a tendency to actually talk about failures rather than successes. So that's another kind of an issue that I just wanted to bring up because it ties a little bit to the... Yeah. No, no, it's, it's, a very, it's very true. The idea of uh, building be real best practices uh, doesn't get often done for... Uh, many people would argue because um, many people in our field continue to view this uh, completely as a discrete uh, uh, artistic enterprise where each thing is a completely independent uh, act. And, and I think... I, but I guess I could separate out <laughs> Um, those issues a little bit, I think. I mean, can, I, I would say, irrespective of, of uh, your and my evaluation of the uh, 
quality of a, of a, of a town plan. The, the data that we, we've now charged David with um, assembling for us all, it's gonna, David's going to have a very large to-do list um, at the end of this. Uh, <laughs> but the, the assembling that data on the performance side of these conversations, which is such a large part of these review processes. I mean, we've just gotten through saying in some of the earlier panels that, that gosh, it's impossible to get these people to talk about design. And because they're obsessed with all these performance issues, if we can get a clearer, more transparent scoreboard for performance stuff, I think it will be easier to talk about design. And I guess, I, and I'd also say that, that the, uh, the business about um, whether the, you know, I, I agree with you, I don't think the quality of the spaces is necessarily going to improve because they're designed with, by digital means. Um, I do sometimes think I can tell buildings that were designed on a computer versus those that weren't, <laughs> but we can have that conversation offline. But there's the thorny question of who gets to say what, what, yeah. what, 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 a, what, a, what a good piece That's of design true. or a of better course. design city, city is. Of, of course. I mean, you know, in, in something that's driven by process and by democratic uh, uh, deliberation. Well, there's some, uh, aren't, we in, aren't we in agreement though that there are some of these metrics that we can't, if we had clear data on, and 95% and of the people think, I don't know, um, less pollution is good, <laughs> and we measure pollution, um, on that criterion alone, we should be able to get a fairly concrete answer. I agree with you that once we get to the, there will always be aspects of the design enterprise that, uh, about which reasonable people might disagree. Uh, but, but we're trying, I think, in, in the, with this, big, ominous title, The Process, we're trying to sort out elements of the process, those that can get fixed one way, those that maybe are working fine as they are, and others that, you know, that, that can get fixed another way. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, and, and I actually um, really feel like we're really getting onto something here because, it, you know, the name of this conference, this session, is about the process, right? And, and so when you juxtapose that with the outcome, right? I mean, in philosophy, that's the question, is that what really matters the process, is that if that's just, if that's fair, or the outcome, if right, that's right. a just or fair outcome. And so those are, that's a tension <laughs> that's going to that's gonna live beyond um, this afternoon. That's totally true. But so what we want to, we want to make sure though that in talking about the process that we focus on that side of the equation, which is that if, if we can make sure that we use just and fair processes, that that'll, that's the best we can do right, and, right, and right. not to. No, this but, you know, well, but, uh, just, just, let me just pick up that sure. on that for one second because that's a very insightful comment. And if you, if you do focus on the outcomes, then the question becomes what are the metrics of success? What are the variables that we should be measuring at the end of the process that constitute a successful outcome? And if we all had a balanced um, and sane set of metrics that we could focus on that included the community and all the people who are involved in the process, um, along the way, then you'd be able to judge how did we do, and how are we yeah. doing relative to how we were doing 100 years ago. But, just but we would just bring we would bring different <laughs> values to that because you would say, well, th there had to be a profit. I might say it has to be beautiful. Someone else might have to say that the process had to be democratic. Well, uh, and um, and and it would not be it would not be an even outcome ever, right? No, but it would be an outcome that could be <laughs> measured, judged with yeah. some objectivity. Well, and, where yeah. you could see how the, all those things were balanced. You know, right. if Cairo Shen were here today, and I'm, I'm sorry he can't be here because he had the prepare for an APA thing. Uh, but uh, I've had this very, very, very conversation with Kairos Shen, the chief of planning for the BRA. And he looks at me sweetly, shakes his head, and says, you know, if you think that you're going to um, uh, eliminate the need for this, hard, this process that you think is so bad by simply getting better and more quantified outcomes, you're nuts because what he would say is, that the process is, of course, performing a whole other function, which has nothing to do with outcomes. And I think we're, right. we're going to get a lot of head nodding here. It has nothing to do with outcomes, and it has everything to do with filling a void in our political system, which is nobody listens to me. Nobody has to listen to me. No one I encounter has to listen to me. At a public meeting, at least those bastards have to listen to me. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, you get a lot of this. If you go to these, for those of you who go to the, the uh, hundreds of them, a lot of the meetings have the same people at them. And it's, 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 it's part of a political enterprise. And, it's and a therapeutic enterprise. It's a therapeutic, it, it is, it's public therapy. And that part, I think, I don't think David's going to be able to fix for us. I think we're going to have to give that to uh, somebody else. Um, because it's, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, because the, the idea was, well, if we could lower, if we could shorten 
an onerously long public <coughs> review process that is two year, takes two years to get a project approved, is very expensive. Wouldn't it be better for everybody to get to just outcomes in three months? And, and of course, every developer I've ever talked to just says, yes, yes, a thousand times yes, that would be fantastic. Yes, yes, but, Cairo says, <laughs> but Cairo says, well, I suppose it would be better to know a little bit earlier, but you do understand we'd have to keep the process going. Even if we got the answers after three months, we'd have to keep the process going for two years. And, you know, I think this is, this is maybe a little bit out of the expertise of this, uh, of this group, in a way. Do you know what I mean? And we, we really need to bring in the psychologists and the political scientists and so forth for this. Mm -hmm. But, but it is, uh, it's important to recognize that, that these things serve multiple purposes. Yeah, I think we're clearly not yet at the point, or I don't know if we ever will be, uh, in any public process of letting technology be the only way. Because you still have to go and have the house parties. You've got to sit on the front porch and drink lemonade. You know, you got to... You got to have the one-on-one -on -one contact, and a lot of that has to be, you know, about people, not about technology. So I'm not sure it'll ever go away, but we can at least inform some of the process. Right. Right. I think there is um, another element of the tools that will help this process is, you know, especially we want to bring out those quiet boys who yeah. comes to the meetings but they That's don't say right. a thing, right. or those who doesn't make it to the meeting. Right. That we have observed with the new technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we have digital divide issues, but a project we're doing in San Jose where we have, um, you know, 100 write-ups, people come, hundreds of, you know, I think more than two, 300 people came to do a whole series of meetings. We got 100 plus write-ups, but we got 200 plus web responses. Mm -hmm. Those that is, you know, through the workbooks, they can, the quiet voice do that. But those who doesn't work with time, they give us web responses. And then what we have observed is just have to reach out to people, use a diverse range mm -hmm. of mediums. Some do Twiggy, tweet, mm. tweet, and some do wikis, and some website, and some people just want to put post-it, right. and some people want to do them all so they are counted multiple times. But you're turning out new constituencies to advocate for maybe new, new, new possibilities in design. Exactly. Not the people who keeps coming to sure, the meeting, generally. who has the time and has the resources to do right. that, but yeah. those others who would put the voice in. Now, on the other side of the equation, though, I mean, we were talking about this morning about community organization and all, you know, how people start grassroots efforts and, you know, to oppose projects. Right. Now, you know, you just start a Facebook page, right? You right. just get a group of people right. connected and engaged and you're on your way. So, mm -hmm. you know, it does go both ways on the technology side, for sure. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I has, uh, does anybody have experience with um, somebody starting a Facebook page? I, I, I hate Curtis's latest project yeah. dot com yeah. and, and it's immediately... Absolutely. Really? Oh, yeah, I, I, for I, sure. I, oh, yeah. I wasn't yeah. aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? We're going to we're 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 going to be finishing in a little while, and I wanted I didn't want us to get through this, Ellen, without asking you one more thing, which is, um, we've been talking uh, a lot about the um, uh, the sort of details of uh, the variables that that we're engaged in trying to measure, um, but we haven't talked about another area that you've done some work in that is so that operates so completely differently, and that's China. And we were talking briefly during the break. Um, I, I was over there for a bit in 2010 and just flabbergasted. Nothing I read could possibly have prepared me for, you know, and everybody tried to prepare me. I don't know, you're going to be amazed. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. There's so much development. I said, yeah, you know, how, you know, how amazing can it be? Well, oh my God, <laughs> it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And there's just no way uh, for someone who's been in Boston for 25 years to even conceive of how all that work could get done in 10 years. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience in China with, 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 the, with the process there? I mean, it's, I don't imagine it's anything like the process here. Well, in some ways, it's like you know, the beginning of what we talked about this morning. I think 10 years, 10, 12 years ago, when we started working on project, I think the process also needs a constituent that is well-informed engage and in some ways educated not you know just knowing what you say it means what and what is the desirable outcome so uh, for instance we worked on a project 1996 and um, there's a historic preservation with new development and we proposed the idea of historic preservation and I remember at a conference somebody said so did you do the community outreach and I said you can't do community outreach there because they will have torn down everything that we want to preserve and 
preserve that building that we say it should go. <laughs> because, because that's a building with bathrooms and kitchen within the unit and everything else down it. But fortunately, the developer took the risk. The, the government also took the risk to, appro to approve it, even though they're not quite sure what they're getting. And I remember that time, uh, at the same time we were working on the project, they're going to build a freeway. <laughs> so the government decided, yes, we're going to do it. And they moved everybody out in 43 days. Mm. We would not have finished our noticing process in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they built that freeway. But now, 10, 15 years later, they are. They are required to do some public outreach. So our project in Guangzhou and other cities, they have to post that on the website to show this is the plan now. And people can um, you know, write in comments. They can give feedback on the website. And we're trying to get feedback, like, so what did they say, right? Our project in San Jose, you can see all the feedback, all the summaries. No, you can't find anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you know if it's important. Yes, yeah, so as the government officials, officially, nobody says a thing. Just say, we did this process, we did it for how many days, we got input. But we did talk to the planners, what kind of input they've got. Um, is, you know, they hated substations next door, so you can't move substation. If it's published, you can't move anything. They hated public toilets next close by in their block, but they want convenience by somebody else's block. Um, they hated trash collection stations nearby. I mean, you know, there's nothing so this is China wrong, or San Jose? It? China. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it, but they're beginning to know there's a voice, and they are, um, there's a project we work on in a southern city called Foshan, and we are promoting preservation in some parts. Uh, uh, nice to find out that there are a community who's watching this developer now. You can't take down these buildings, and then they will provide feedback. Even though I think in the governmental framework, they still are not used to the kind of transparency we're talking about, with the public kind of sharing information in that way. They're moving that way. So I think they will move. It will take some time, not as long as we took, like right, everything right, is faster right, right, in China. Right, right, right. But it will be different, because I heard that the model they really uh, value is the Singapore model. We have a socialist democracy, so it's not all democracy, right, right, but it's socialist. Right. So um, they might not be able to do a freeway interchange and vacate that in 43 days now, right. but still much faster than we do in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's super interesting. But it's, I think it takes us, I think some of us are also doing work in Asia, is to bring ideas, to bring the right practices. I was talking to Iran a little earlier. Many things they are doing are things that we don't do anymore, the 70s, the 60s model, that if we know it's not good. And how do you show them that, yes, China is different from America, but we are all about, you know, two, three inches high difference. We all like certain things. And you will suffer the consequence if you do it that way. Right. And it's not even reaching out to the public because if you can't reach the government officials, you can't even get to the public. So there's a lot, and you know, any of you have time, whatever. <laughs> I think they can take all your advices on what we have learned. Right. Right. No, it's, it's, su it's super interesting to see um, <coughs> the, you know, the scale of. And we went to the. We went to the there's a planning museum right in Beijing, right near the, the center of the city, and you know you've just never. I don't know if any of you have been to this planning museum, but it's it's just it's just shocking. <laughs> there's so much that's you know. Okay, this was just done in the last three years. This whole big section of the city that's bigger than most cities in the United States. And then here's what we're planning next. And yes, some of it we're we're, we're planning as if it were 1982 in the United States. Some of it we're planning as though it was 1971 in California. Uh, you know. but, but George, you know, it's important to realize that um, most of the work that Hausman did in Paris was done in a period of time shorter than it took to do the big dig here. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. No, fair enough. So there fair are enough. periods in history where the people get things done well, if they have the right political authority. You know, I, of course, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't need to persuade me of that, I think, as you know. But, but um, all I can say is Hausman's work in Paris looks like a weekend, uh, a, a, a weekend job compared to yeah, I know. any of the things I saw. Uh, still, it was a lot of hundred. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it was obviously one hundred twenty years ago. <laughs> it's a deal. big deal. Um, no, I, I want to ask the panelists before we finish up. I want to ask the panelists if there's any other parts of this that you feel like we missed. If there's something that you desperately wanted to say that I repressed you from saying. 
Yes. Well, uh, I have three more yes. books. Here. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, uh, rather than go into that, I, I think it was just touched on, but I think perhaps one of the most powerful things that has yet to emerge is the true scalability. And, uh, you know, this, this came up a little bit, but, you know, everything really does have to work its way up to the planetary and back down to the micro. And we don't really quite know how to do that yet. We can kind of fake it. And I, uh, uh, I'm just having a, a flash of uh, Eames's movie, Powers of Ten, mm -hmm. and thinking of how the first version of that, uh, when they start to get out into space, the guy's drawing real fast to kind of simulate what's going on out there. But, uh, you know, we know better than ever that everything is connected to everything and that, uh, and that the planet actually is feeding back to us what we're... Uh, feeding to it, but we haven't uh, made that part of the decision process in any effective way. So th there's a lot of work to be done in, in tools development, and I think, you know, we've identified in some of these books some of the directions that needs to go, so please come up afterwards and <laughs> take them home. No, I think it's, a, it's an interesting point um, on the scalability issue of how you, and, and it goes back to sort of how you measure success of a project, and if you're doing an urban infill project, there's only so much impact you can have within that urban environment. And the whole smart cities movement, you know, there's, it's impossible to implement some of the technology that, that these folks want to do without going in onto a greenfield site and building it first and seeing how it works and testing it and seeing what the behavior looks like, Mazdar, and, and we're involved with one in Portugal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem we haven't yet figured out. And then it gets into, I think, what David's working on, which is, you know, the behavior stuff. And how do you, how do you measure and evaluate behavior? which is how people perform in an environment. And some of it is sort of uh, the, the pleasure principle of how it feels to be in a space, but some of it is how it influences your decisions on the way that you live. Do you walk instead of drive? Um, if you know how much gas you're using, do you use less? That's the Prius model. Um, so there's a whole, I mean, I think that we're just at the, we're just at the beginning, really. I think there's, there's so much yet to explore. Well, it does, it does certainly seem that the, the issue of, um, you know, our, being firmly in this, what I would call the you know, sort of age of performance now. It's not that the other issues that we've dealt with previously don't matter anymore. It's just that at almost every one of those powers of 10 scales, mm -hmm. we are trying to better understand how our environment performs. And I think that the data, the growth of things like these different ways of mapping data and tracking it, we really do have to get more coordinated on which project it is we're trying to address. And, and you know, in the same way that, if, if I could say so, in the same way that medical professionals and researchers keep their eye on, a, on specific prizes. I'm not saying that that's what all uh, arch architectural academic work or design planning academic work needs to do. But if we're going to work in those areas, we need to be more organized and focused about it, I think. Yes, Ellen, I'm sorry. Um, in a, the uh, second session just now, I saw there was a very good question whether the, the public process, whether that results in investing less money in quality buildings or whether it brings out you know, uh, quality design because they need that for approval. I think there is this thing, at least we observe in California, is the process encourages sprawl. Because you tend to be in the urban area, people are better engaged, they are you know, more interested in that. It makes the process challenging whereas on the edge of the cities or in the greenfield, <coughs> one development no or people are less engaged in the process. So there's less contention. There's, less, yeah. yes, there's nobody to engage. Yeah. So well, this how, is, as but, but, I mean, this is what de Tocqueville said you know, right. uh, a long time ago. Uh, right. The whole country was made that way. This is the way. whole premise yeah. of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't like it, leave. Yeah. Well, no, you know, I don't like, I, I don't like you. I'll just move to, I'll just move to Kansas. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No Yes, yeah, so um, what do we do as a professional to steer that? Yeah. <laughs> Justin, you, you look like you want to say that. Okay. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Ivan, go ahead. Um, well, I, just, I had a question to both, I guess the whole group, which is that we talked about tools to help understand the complexity of the city, but I guess some of these published rules processes are becoming more complex than the city. And I guess, is, you know, are there tools now for even studying? I mean, is there tools for at least documenting and studying these incredibly complex processes where you have 220 meetings? And is that information because these experiments just kind of going into the ether? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that mm -hmm. should be collected or can be collected yeah. or can be used to maybe design the process? Hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So next one, idea. That's an yeah. interesting yeah. question. <laughs> I mean, we've looked at for projects that we've worked on. How many public meetings? How many days did we spend on the ground? And when you look at it, it's really, it's still terribly inefficient. We're, yeah. we're spending a lot of resources on jet fuel, fuel to travel back and forth to run these processes in cities that we don't live in. Um, but you, you know, because this, you still need that human component. This is where this is where Cairo Shen's point really uh, resonates because. If the BRA, just to use the local example, if the BRA's interest is in making sure that um, political opposition to projects is kept at the most manageable level, ironically, you know what the thing they most, they're most interested in at the end of one of these public meetings? is not how effective was it, it's did everybody sign the signing list? Because I need documentation that you were at the meeting. That's the primary purpose of the meeting, so. Well, because they're risk averse. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, but George, I mean, sorry, Tim, just before you chime in on this, I have to say something about it. In my view is that if you've had 200 public meetings, that's a process that's broken. Yeah. It should not take 200 public meetings to decide something. It could take 20. But somebody, you know, what's happened, I mean, I'm hearing the story about China. I'm thinking i got to move to China because I'm never going to build a skyscraper in the United States in my life. Right. right? But if I move to China, I could build one in a year. Move to right. Toronto. Or, so, so I think, now there's an example of, you know, you can't trample on the community and just sort of push your whole development agenda through as a government or as a private entity. I mean, we learned that in the 60s. Okay, that's an, that's an imbalance. But I think we've gone too much the other way. So that now, in many ways, the BRA really is a steward of the community. And it's the community groups who are running the process. And the BRA is sort of well, not really managing what's going on quite as much as they might as a planning agency. Right. I think so, if you ask the, the, the uh, community groups, they would say well, the BRA is managing it for the developers. But that's, they might. that's another conversation. But, but I think, George, what I'm, what I'm arguing for, whether you the, the, the exact balance is correct or not. I guess what I'm saying is balance right. would be nice. Sure. I'm not asking to be able to run the show. Sure, sure. I'm perfectly happy to balance my interests with those of the community. It would be helpful to have a more efficient process mm -hmm. through which we could do that and where balanced interests were actually being Well, I think, we're getting, I think we got at some of the things that could help that process be more transparent and more efficient on a lot of outcomes. But Tim, go ahead. I, I, I think against the technology, um, designers and Well, this, that's, this goes to the point of, of um, building a, a, a cumulative research that is more along the lines of what some other disciplines do uh, than, so we're, we're paid, than the one up. We're being paid to run one of these processes. We're, we're being paid monies to provide content. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a kind of grant that you get through the content of a particular project. And so the, the, you know, Peter Rose's issues in the second panel about cars versus transportation, we're generating that content all the time when we're doing Just have a, okay, maybe just a couple more. Uh, I'm sorry, you, yeah, two, you are next. Uh, just to uh, bridge the discussion from panel one to mm -hmm. panel three, I uh, just want to mention one of the landmarks in architecture and planning was the demolition of the Pruitt Igo housing development in you know, 1972, which only lasted 15 years, and it was a product of the uh, elite minds in architecture and right. social theory at the time. Right. And, and so I don't know whether a different process had been in place back in St. Louis at that time, whether a different
back to times when we actually did city plans. And the last city plan in Boston was a wonderful orange book that was done in 1965. And the fact that everyone's mentioned that predictability and certainty is not only important to developers, but it's also very important to the public. Mm -hmm. The pre-planning process, whatever shape it takes, has always been uh, an exceptionally important part of getting a consensus and, and an agreement. Yeah. The lack of planning leads to a, a situation where everything is negotiable on both the public part and on the private part. So a lot of these protracted community meeting things are because no one made some decisions about the larger context within which the project sure. is going to happen. I think we need to kind of revisit the notion that master planning uh, in some new form has some agency, yeah. yeah. Oh, has agency. It gives agency. No, no, and I mean, I think we all know in this town anyway, probably why there hasn't been uh, a big master plan since, because that was seen as um, evidence of the, of, the, of the disasters. In other words, that they disasters happened after a big plan. And, and, and therefore, we'll never do a big plan again. I mean, I don't think people in this room would say that's a good idea, but I think we would say that's probably why that happened. Peter? Maybe it doesn't work in Boston, but it works in most of you know, most the U.S. zoning movies, everything. Is something about which to be optimistic. Um, and I think we're at the beginning of seeing a proliferation of all kinds of tools, many of them disconnected, many of them behind doors. Uh, not so well understood, so uh, so available. But I, I was at the Brookings Institute a year or two ago with a guy, who I think he was the head of the urban, whatever it was there, urban group, Post -cuts. advising Cuts. the Obama government on spending lots and lots of money um, on cities. I think it had to do with transportation, probably you know, my interest. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what data they were using and, and how they were making these decisions. And he, pulled out a book of spreadsheets, and that's all they have. Right, right, right. And I would say that um, the way people design and build airplanes, let's say, to keep, make them efficient to keep them from crashing and to test them before they actually assemble them, or the way physicians analyze us with these fabulous, they're just digital tools, the CAT scans are also these wonderful artistic <coughs> I think most decisions at city level at the, at the scale of the city or the scale beyond the city are guesswork with respect to what the 50 year outcome is going to be. And I think if we could understand the cross connection between environment and economy and transportation and who knows what by yeah, using some of these project, tools, so. we could do a little bit better testing. So fear of the plan. No, I, I, I totally agree. And I think we're going to actually bring it to, to an end on, 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 on this point. I'd like to, we're gonna, I'd like to invite everybody uh, to a reception uh, out in the lobby uh, following this, but I'd really like to thank this excellent panel. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.